Hello ladies and gents, we're now looking at um, section one of learning aim B. Um, this is almost like an instruction. There's a number of things that you need to talk about. And I've also outlined some of the pages that you need to look at. That's going to give you the key information that you need and the knowledge that you need to actually uh, address these points and get the top marks. Um, so let's look at the first section, an instruction. Um, as uh, I mentioned in the last series of videos, just bear in mind if you are following me through these videos, so boys and girls, if you're listening to my lessons, you do not delete anything. The red is there to help you. They are the questions that prompt your 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 thinking, so you can get the right information on there. Um, but in the real thing, you won't have anything. It will be just this table, and then it'll be blank. So the black is what I would say you're allowed to copy. The black is basically subtitles. They're fine. I would suggest they are there to give you guidance and they are there to help you. But the questions, unfortunately, will not be. It won't be permitted. Your teachers, myself, will not be allowed to give you any help when you start the real thing. So, looking at this practice, this mock, um, the way we start, obviously, is bringing an instruction. So, project planning or project planning methodology. So, first things first, you need to say, what is the aim of this project? What is it that you're hoping to do? What have you been asked to do? Now, anytime you talk about any aim, Anytime you see the word aim or goal or objective, you need to make sure that it's smart. And then you might be thinking, what is smart? Well, it's an acronym and it stands for four, sorry, five separate words. And I've got a picture ready for you here, but it is on page 42 to 43. Please make sure you go through those tasks and activities of the book. It does have everything you need and it's well worth your time uh, uh, practicing these points before we start uh, before you start this so smart actually uh, stands for uh, targets that are uh, made specific that are made to be measurable attainable or achievable relevant and timed or time bound so now we need to explain what those things are but like i said it's on page 42 to 43 but i'll give you a quick overview right now as a uh, as a nice reminder so hopefully, you know, I'm not going to, I can't spend too much time going through every single thing here because otherwise these videos will be more than 15, 20, 30 minutes long and really want to make them as short and snappy as, uh, as I can uh, because they're supposed to just a quick outline of what you're doing in those sections. So when you say I aim to do this or uh, I'm, I'm hoping to do this, then you need to make sure whatever that is or this is, you need to make sure that it's specific. So make sure your goals, your aims are focused and identify tangible outcome. Without the specifics, your goal runs the risk of being too vague uh, to achieve. Being more specific helps you identify what you want to achieve. You should also identify what resources you are going to uh, leverage or use to achieve success. And it's immeasurable. So you should have some clear definition of success. This will help you to evaluate achievement and also progress. This component often answers how much or how many uh, and highlights how you'll know you achieved your goal. So if you're aiming to create a, uh, a good user interface, a friendly user interface, uh, then you're going to say, okay, how, how do you define good? How do you define friendly? What is it that your user interface needs to have for you to say, yeah, I've done this, this and this, that means it is now good. Yeah. So imagine if your parents came into parents evening and your teachers, you know, was asked the question, how's my son or daughter doing? And they just said, yeah, they're doing good. But good could mean a hundred different things. So it has to be specific. And then if your, parent, if your teacher then said, oh, yeah, your son or your daughter needs to do better. Better could mean a number of things as well. What, how, what do they need to do to make sure they become better? Better where? In the classwork, in the homework. And even then we can go further on and say, okay, what can they do in their classwork to make it better? Is it the level of work? Is it the quality of the written uh, 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 sentences and structures of your sentences? Is it that you're not, you haven't got the right content or the use of terminology? What is it? So you have to be specific. So if you're going to say here what you're aiming to do and make that specific, then you're going to say how you know you're going to do it, so measurable, attainable, sometimes known as achievable. Your goal should be uh, challenging, but it still needs to be reasonable, meaning it needs to be realistic. It needs to be something that is uh, something that, for example, if you say I'm going to do this within two days and you know that's going to take five, then it's not attainable, it's not achievable, it's not realistic. So it needs to be something that you can actually achieve. Um, reflecting on this component can re uh, reveal any potential barriers that you may need to overcome to realize success. Outline the steps you plan to take to achieve your goals. It needs to be relevant, meaning it needs to be linked to what you're doing. So, for example, if you're going to start talking about um, 
uh, introducing some kind of game to make it interactive and fun for children. But then you've got to ask yourself, okay, a game may not be suitable for a user interface designed for a doctor's surgery because, well, think about it, why wouldn't that be relevant? Okay, hopefully, you've had a few seconds to think about it. When customers come in, or customers would be known as patients in this situation because it's a doctor's surgery, you don't want a uh, child to be hogging the, uh, the tablet, playing a game while people are waiting to uh, sign in to make um, uh, doctor's appointments, cancel doctor's appointments. It's there for a purpose. It's work-related. It's there to help people. If you put a game on there, it's not going to be relevant to what what uh, what what it is that you you were hoping in the first place, and in fact, it's going to do the opposite. You're going to have a child playing a game on that tablet, and that means it's going to push and force everyone to start lining up again. And that was the whole point of this new user interface. They wanted to make the queue smaller, so it needs to be relevant to what it is that you're aiming to. Going back to that aim at the beginning, and then time bound. Every goal needs to have a target date. So as as soon as you know what you're going to do, how it needs to be done, so how you know it's going to be done. You're going to need to make it uh, relevant and achievable and you need to say, okay, this is going to take two or three days. If it's going to take two or three days, then you know what the time is then, two, two or three days from the start date. Okay, but you need to make sure that you know something that motivates you to really apply the focus and discipline necessary uh, to achieve it. This answers when um, it's important to set uh, realistic time frames to achieve your goal to ensure you don't get discouraged. So if you look at that, you see actually that makes sense. You know, if you make your targets smart, um, then you're making quality aims or objectives. Going back to the section, you got some questions there. What have you been asked to do? Okay, how long do you have to do it? Who is asking you? These questions, the answers are in this brief, and this is why the last video is so important. Why it's so important for you to understand um, the the brief, understanding what it is that you're asking for. So you're going to get the answers from here for this part here. Now, you do are, you are looking for at least a paragraph, maybe more, to answer this section and have this instruction done nice and neatly. Okay. Then we're going to talk about project methodology. Now, this is a tricky one. If you've not actually looked at um, uh, what project methodology actually means, turn to page 36 uh, and 37 for help. It does go through it uh, uh, for you. And you, what you need to do is basically, once you've read through those uh, two pages, um, you need to, ex at, first of all, decide which one you're going to go for and then say why. So are you going to go for the waterfall methodology or the iterative methodology? Um, now, again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It is on page 36 and 37. Make sure you have that copy in front of you uh, and go through it if you haven't done so already. But I'm going to give you a quick overview. Waterfall is simply when you do things step at a time. Um, now, for a lot of us, you might think, okay, that makes sense. You know, I'm going to, here's just an example. I'm going to find out what requirements there are. I need to then design it. Then I need to develop it. Then I need to test it. And then I need to maintain it. That's it. Done. But the problem with this is, you know, that, that might be okay for most cases. The problem with this is that there's only one element of testing. And the user doesn't get to see your design until you've finished it right at the end. So there's no interaction with the user in between to see if you're going in the right direction or not. And by the point, by the time they see it, at that point, maybe too late, and it can take a, a long time. So that's the waterfall methodology. Now there might be instances that you're using waterfall, but then in general, you might be using the iterative methodology. Now the iterative method methodology is more like this, where you do you have one iteration, one um, style, one attempt. Uh, where you plan, uh, you get the analysis, so the requir requirement, uh, yeah, so you get the uh, the user requirements and you know of what it is that you need to do, you need to get the design, then you build it, then you test it, and then you go on to the next one, the next version, so it's like a draft one, a draft two, a draft three. Now, most um, games, for example, will go for the iteration process, because they can't just make one version of it and then off, off you go. They, there will be months of design and testing. There will be constant feedback fed in to understand where things could be improved, where things aren't so great, and so on and so forth. So this is why it's called iteration. You could argue that actually that one cycle there is very similar to the waterfall, yeah? But the difference is they go through it as a cycle and they have user feedback in between and they use that feedback to make the second version and then do it one more time. And then they use that feedback to do it a third time. So you have to decide 
which way you're going to be doing this. Because remember, you're going to be designing a piece of software here. You're not going to actually make the piece of software, which is great. It means, you know, less work for you. But that's not what the marking criteria requires you to do. It is the design itself. So you have to think about how it would be. So you're going to do everything up to the point where you have to actually make it. Everything up to that point. So, which one are you going to go for? You're going to go for the water, waterfall methodology or the iterative methodology? Whichever one you choose, or if you want to say, I'm going to use this first for some parts and then that, that's fine. But you have to say which one and then explain. You have to justify it. So, you have to talk about the pros and cons of the choice that you've made. Which one is better and why? Okay. But again, page 36 to 37 has, has all the information you need. I've gone through it as well very, very briefly. But also, if you go into Google and just type in water, water, waterfall methodology, iterative method methodology, uh, I think it's also known as agile methodology, you can go to YouTube and check it out as well and get that information and get that understanding. Once you understand what those things in, it will mean and you've got the pros and cons, then you can then you know, really talk about it. So that should be a paragraph there as well. The last thing you need to do, and this is another subtitle, is project requirements. Now, this one, all you got to do is answer these questions. First things first, what is the purpose of the user interface that you plan to design? So, what is it that you're asking, uh, you've been asked to make? What's it supposed to do? Yeah, who is it aimed at? So, don't just say, oh, it, <coughs> this user interface I'm making, excuse me, is for the draws in medical practice. Yeah, it is for them, but who do they want using that? use interface is it going to be the doctors and the person at the reception or someone else i'd like to think that most of you will know now by now if you've seen the last video and you've seen the brief and you read through it even though it's for the medical practice it's the it's the clients it's the it's the patients who walk in who will be using it it's the people that go in, are going in for the doctor's appointments or need to cancel appointments or look at repeat prescriptions so it's not the people working there but the public um, what accessibility needs and requirements would you uh, would you need to have? Well, think about it. If in this case it's the public, then you know that we have different kinds of people, yeah, different backgrounds, different user needs, different uh, cultural needs, and um, you know requirements in terms of you know you can't guess if someone's going to come in and and everyone will be able to see. Some people may not be able to see properly. Some may some may not be able to hear properly, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you need to think about those kind of uh, items. Um, look back to learning aim A when you talked about the whole array of things like skills levels and demographics and things like that. You need to bring those back in. What output requirements are there? So basically, what things will be seen, what things will be heard, and what things will be felt. That's what haptic means. So if you've got a phone, uh, uh, most of you probably will have a smartphone. Uh, sometimes when you press certain things on your screen, there's a um, a vibration uh, and it, it, it indicates that you basically clicked on something that you touched something so that's haptic feedback that's what they actually call it so what visual audio and haptic feedback will you have while um, you know while your user the public is uh, making use of the user interface so the visual side will be the buttons and the uh, options that you have the audio side might be com confirmation of things that they clicked on maybe you'll have a text at the bottom that says uh, top left button this bottom right button this so you may have some audio um um what's the word i'm looking for audio instructions and prompts helping people who can't see properly uh, to, to do what they need to do uh, haptic feedback so is there going to be any vibration maybe there won't be but you know you need to decide that then what input requirements are there so this is what things come out that's where it says output yeah and make sure you use correct terminology here so the output requirements could be that you know this this and that but the input requirements is how things will be put in. If you just turn those words around, it makes more sense. But how are things going to be put in to your user interface? So, is it going to be through a mouse, keyboard? Is it going to be voice activated? Is it going to be through touch? Well, there's going to be two things here that you're going to straight away say is the correct answers. And two that you can say, no, in this case, it's not that. Because if you understood the brief, you know that it's said, it said very clearly that they want you to make a touchscreen device user interface. Okay, so if it's a touchscreen device, then you know you're gonna have touch as a bare minimum, and maybe a voice um, you know, navigation as well. For those who may have visual uh, requirements, visual needs, because they can't see properly, so they want to control it through their voice. Um, keyboard and mouse may, will probably not, not not make any sense. Although you could say that you're going to have an on-screen keyboard, yeah, in certain situations. For example, when they want to book an appointment, they have to type in um, their name and address. So you're going to say, as long as you say it's an on-screen keyboard, you can get marks and explain. 
Don't just say, oh, I'm going to have an on-screen keyboard, give me a list, boys and girls. Never, ever, ever give a list. You need to give paragraphs. You need to use full sentences. Use the P-Well method, the Peel method, where you point, uh, use evidence and explain, and then link to the next point. You have to do that. This is coursework. So do not just give lists here, okay? You need to explain what you're going to use and why. That brings us to the end of this video. Hopefully, you've got a, a, a brief understanding uh, of what it is that you expect to do. As a bare minimum, there should be three paragraphs, one for each one here. But you know, those who are aiming for higher than that, I'd expect two paragraphs and each for the six paragraphs in total.